Yeah, sometimes we like fight to like and being in the front, I'm always like, oh god, they're all gonna be like, is she gonna fall asleep? Is she gonna do it? <laughs> so are those the peeps in Calgary? Yes. Who's on? The mic's on. Oh, yeah. Did I say that? Bella, did you see the large, the world's largest mushroom? Yes. Wow, wow. Well, well, because your life is all different. Everything's downhill from there, right? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll know You're like, like fuck it, Liz. Good morning. I know Janice and I had all these big plants at all bosses on the bread. Well, I had a lesson Not just at the end of last year, which I forgot. To so I had a lesson, and um, I have I went to the driving range. Yeah. I have so many of them. I'm always yelling. So. Yeah, and <laughs> apparently they're short. I, I, but like I didn't go and store by the park yet. They were partying like from the church when I left. And this guy who golfs a lot. So I just it never occurred to me that I would like that they are. So anyway, she had me swing on her gloves, which was my thing. And made a difference. So okay. I do the clubs. Okay. Kids camp and I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, yeah. 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 Oh, so you went to adult clubs. Apparently. <laughs> I don't know what those were. Hi. And like, they have that problem too. So as soon as I had the right size club, years. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm not like all punched over. Yeah. Right. And okay, no, I'm actually in a meeting right now. Can I get back to yeah, this? Super feminine. Like, like, yeah, this seems normal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. So. Okay. I mean, I'm. It's not my goal to do it. My goal to do it. You guys turn it up. Is that better? All right. Sometimes you just can't tell. Just because I've got a loud voice. Uh, anyways, lots going on around here. And uh, uh, I'm not going to take the time to talk about it because I want to give as much time as possible to our, our speaker today. But next Wednesday, uh, we're going to take uh, the whole Faith Connect. And I'm just going to kind of give you an update on what's been going on, decision. We've changed uh, uh, the org chart. A uh, number of people are in new positions, and we want to let you know some of that. Some of that you'll, you will get filtered down through your director or your manager. But as a whole, we need uh, to take some time to talk about that. Uh, tomorrow, uh, we have a board of directors meeting. And of course, out of the board of directors meeting, there are always interesting things uh, that arise. And so uh, uh, we're going to focus next Wednesday on 
uh, just kind of giving you a quarterly update on what's going on around here and uh, what we see uh, what we see happening and opportunities in front of us. Uh, one of the things I'll talk about next week is uh, is Red Deer. Uh, last night we were there for a town hall with the community and we had about 100 people show up. A uh, very positive uh, time. Uh, I think they're, uh, they are exci as excited as we are uh, to be there, but I'll be sharing a little more information about that as well. Um, uh, sometime today, um, uh, David, this is just for Calgary, is going to be sending out a, um, an email about a Calgary prayer walk. So pay attention to your, um, your email uh, uh, and see and read about that as, as he gets that finished. Of course, uh, what, what's happening at the end of next week? What's next Friday? Stampede. Yes, Stampede Barbecue, the Stampede Parade. Uh, and we're looking for people to help with the, with the, uh, uh, at the parade, uh, handing out invitations. Uh, talk to your manager and see if they'll give you an hour or two off uh, to go do that. Uh, we do have a policy, right, that uh, if you go to the stampede, you don't have to come to work. We don't? <laughs> We've got a new policy. <laughs> but, okay, listen. But, <laughs> just stay at home. Okay? You come in, check in, and then you go to the... You can go to the parade, but at the same time, you might want to also take some flyers, invite people to our our stampede lunch afterwards. All right. Um, uh, as most of, how many of you, uh, for how many of you will this be the first time that you've been at the mustard seed for the Calgary Stampede? Okay. So just a just a very brief. Uh, we have permission from the city to block off the street, and so the street will be blocked off, and we're going to have a, a giant party. Uh, last year we had over, we served over 2,000 people lunch, so that's a lot of people, and so we're going to ask you to get involved, be friendly, smile. I, I know you always do that, but but to smile. Uh, so that's happening uh, next Friday. And then on Thursday, the 14th, there's the Stampede Shelter Breakfast. And that's from uh, 10 to, to noon. And at that time, we, we serve a free pancake, pancake breakfast, live music. Uh, they have some games. And so uh, there'll be a bus heading down to the shelter at 9.30 and returning downtown at noon. Uh, families are also welcome, so if you want to bring your, your family out, that would be great. Uh, it's another way for us to say thanks to the community around the shelter for their support uh, over the years, and we have a great relationship with, with them as well. Uh, next week I already mentioned that I'll be giving you an update, uh, but today, uh, on, uh, on Monday, was it Monday? It was just Monday or Tuesday? Monday. Monday, okay. This, is, uh, this week's got a lot in it. Uh, on Monday, we had a leadership retreat over way, way, way down the street at the Canoff Center. Uh, but we, we felt it was important to get off campus for a couple of minutes, or for a day, I got, actually. And in the morning, uh, we had uh, Dan Gaynor, who's our speaker today, speak to us of, about feedback and the importance of feedback. He's not going to talk about that today. But, uh, but it was actually uh, you know, uh, some great lessons for each of us. Uh, some of you may know Dan. Dan, um, you know, he's done a lot of things. Uh, one of the things that most people remember about him is he was the editor of the uh, Calgary Herald for how many years? 14? Publisher. Oh, he was the publisher of the Herald. Okay, for four years. All right. See, I really screwed that all up. But uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I need an editor. So, uh, Dan, we're excited to hear what God has placed on your heart and look forward to listening. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Uh, what a blessing for me uh, to be here with you. I've, uh, I remember when I first came to Calgary in 99 uh, as the publisher of the Herald, uh, one of my first meetings was with the Mustard Seed and Irene Pfeiffer. And so I go way back with the seed and, and I've been... Uh, 
pretty passionate about the work you do for quite some time. So anyway, as I was coming here today, uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to talk about. I said, what, you know, what do you want me to talk about? And the advice I got was, why don't you just talk about what God's put on your heart? So I thought a lot about that. And uh, there are a couple things I think God would like me to say to you and a couple things he'd like me to share with you today. So I'm going to share a little bit of really abbreviated version of my story so you get a sense for how I got to where we are today. And then I'm going to share maybe a little bit of what I think God wants me to say to you and what he wants me to share with you. So I wasn't always a Christian. I uh, spent the first 30 years of my life as an atheist. And I was a proud, passionate atheist boy. I was the guy that would persecute the Christians and take them on at every opportunity. But at 30 years old, I had my my own kind of a road to Damascus moment. And uh, I remember at the time I was living in Edmonton. Hi, Edmonton. I spent 15 years in Edmonton. And I was living in Edmonton, and I, I had uh, left the newspaper business for a short period of time, and I was trying to get back into it. So I'd applied for a job at the Edmonton Journal as a sales representative, advertising sales representative. And I'd put the uh, application in, and it seemed to be going, to a going absolutely nowhere. And at the time, I was selling for another company. And I remember going around 102nd Street, for those of you guys up in Edmonton will know this spot, right around the old Henry Singer building at Jasper Avenue and 102nd Street. And there was an old building behind there. And I thought, I should really go into that building and just make a few calls. Didn't really know why, but I thought, okay, I'll, I'll just go. So anyway, I went in. I made a few cold calls around the top of the building and came to absolutely nothing. I figured it was a big waste of time. So I went to push the elevator button to go back down and call it a day. And somebody came out of an adjoining office that I'd worked with years earlier. And she said to me, uh, Dan Gaynor, how are you? And I didn't even know she worked in the building. I said, I'm great, Anne-Marie. How are you? And we got chatting one thing or another. And she said to me, um, what are you doing these days? And I said, well, you know, I'm working for PB. And she said, how's that going? I said, well, I ain't not so great. I'm kind of looking around a bit. And she said, oh, what are you looking at? And I said, well, you know, I got an application in at the Edmonton Journal. Well, her eyes just about popped out of her head. She said, not the Edmonton Journal. I said, yeah. She said, my best friend is the Vice President of Human Resources at the Edmonton Journal. <laughs> and I knew in one heartbeat, one heartbeat, that there was a God and that he loved me. And for some reason, he seemed to want to help me. So and it, wasn't a, it wasn't a deductive reasoning thing. It wasn't in me trying to figure it out. I just knew in my, the deepest part of me that there was a God. He loved me. He was trying to help me. So I went from atheist to seeker. See, I was okay with God, but I never really faced the Jesus question. And I wasn't so sure about the whole church thing because a couple of church experiences I had weren't all that hot. So I used to like to quote Jethro Tull. You know, my God's not the kind of God you've got to wind up on Sundays. <laughs> So anyway, I went into a long period of time as a seeker, 17 years, and then I came to Calgary where God had big plans. And God had been very vivid in my experience through those 17 years, but I hadn't really faced, the, I hadn't really come to grips with who Jesus was. So here in Calgary, uh, God brought three big events together to bring me from seeker to believer. And the first of which is I had, uh, at the time, the Herald, some of you guys are pretty young, you won't remember this, but the Herald went through a very difficult labor dispute. A 236 day strike, eight months, very, very difficult. And I met with three very senior members of the clergy here in town. I always call this the one event. Two of them said to me, uh, Dan, God would be angry with you. Put those people back to work. And these two didn't know anything about my circumstances or about those circumstances. But then I met a third one. Some of you will remember this third one, and it was Pastor Ray Matheson. And uh, Pastor Ray Matheson at the time said to me, I can't imagine how difficult this must be on you and your family, Dan. If you ever need anyone to talk to, to yell at, to pray with you, uh, just call me. And I remember the contrast between the two of them really stood out. Here were these two who were trying to judge and prescribe a solution. And here was this other guy who was just doing what he does. He was just loving me. And I'm sure he was doing the same thing with the people who were on strike. I never took him up on that invitation, but that was the first of the event. Second of it, first of the three events. Second event uh, was the sale of Southam to Canwest Global, 
which uh, that was a big that that was a real career bump for me because at the time I was kind of the odds on favorite to become the next president of the company, the whole company nationally. So when it got sold out from underneath me, it was more than a little career bump. So I wrestled that for that for about 18 months, and that brings us through to kind of 2002. And and I've been praying a lot during this whole walk, and oftentimes getting some answers to my prayers. And I've been praying through this difficult period when God finally said to me very clearly. He said, Dan, it was an, your newspaper career is over. It was an apprenticeship for something I had planned for you. And I got this incredible sense of peace that just flowed through me. And uh, I went home, told my wife I was leaving my $250,000 a year job as the president publisher of the Herald. And she pretty much freaked out because I've been the sole provider for about you know 20 years. And then she said, well, why? And I said, well, honey, because God's told me to. Well, that didn't help. <laughs> So then the, the third event that happened, happened February 1st. And i uh, tell you a little bit about that one. On February 1st, that was the day that Mount Cheops came down and claimed the lives of seven kids from Strathcona Tweedsmere High School. And uh, when we first moved from uh, St. Catharines to Calgary to take over at the Herald, my wife Sarah and I have two daughters. Our daughters were competitive figure skaters. So we joined the Cal Alta Skating Club where they met uh, Marissa Stadden. Marissa Stadden was the only girl in that group that lost her life in the avalanche. And so I remember when I heard about the avalanche, it was a Saturday night, and I was entertaining about 1,200 people at a Herald Long Service dinner at the Stampede Grounds when I got the news that seven kids had lost their lives. And we didn't have names then. We knew there were six boys and one girl that had perished. And I remember thinking, oh, don't let it be Marissa, God. Please don't let it be Marissa. And then the next day, of course, I found out it, it was Marissa. So that brought us back to a church for the first time in eight or nine years. And we went to First Alliance Church on the old Glenmore campus for Marissa's celebration of life. Now, to appreciate this story, you have to understand that our eldest daughter, Paige, and Marissa both shared the exact same birth date, June the 13th, 1987. So I'm sitting in the sanctuary with my family, and Marissa is, or Paige is sitting on my left and Haley, our younger daughter, and Sarah are sitting on my right. And Paige was going through these periods of just this bottomless anger and despair. And she was angry in that moment. And, and I said the only thing that came to mind, I said, baby, what was your favorite memory of Marissa? And without hesitation, she said, daddy was birthday cakes at the rink. And in the second she said that, the two big screens at First Alliance lit up with a pay picture of Paige and Marissa with their 13th birthday cake. And I didn't even know Donna, her mom, had the picture. And I got this overwhelming, saturating sense of God's presence and his love. And I remember being in that church and thinking two things. I remember thinking, one, I've never been in a church like this. Like, this is a church where these people love God, and his love for them is so evident. And so I'm coming back. And, uh, and the second thing I thought was, i got to get a Bible. I'd never read a single word of the Bible. So the next week, I'm driving down 11th Avenue, within a block or two of where we're standing, and there was a store called the Bible Store. And I thought, well, they must sell Bibles. So in I pulled, and I said to the woman, I need a Bible. She said, what kind? I remembered an NIV. I said, I need an NIV. She said, what kind? I said, you have more than one kind? She, she said, yeah, well, you could, you could get a study Bible. I said, what's a study Bible? She said, well, it has notes at the bottom of each page that help you understand what you're reading. As God is my witness, I looked at her and I said, I don't want that. I don't want to cheat. <laughs> so, so she sold me this little home and reference Bible. And I took it home and I started to read it. And it was like the, the words were just like popping off the page at me, and I understood what God was saying. And, you know, as I like to say now, that that, that Bible brought me face to face with what I really believe is the most important question of, of every life. Who is Jesus? And so in the spring of 2003, I came to believe that Jesus is exactly who he said he is. He is the Son of God who came to forgive our sons, our sins and give us the presence of new life. And so I committed my life to Christ in that year, and I left the Herald about the same time. I'd like to say it was all easy. It was not. Let me tell you that late conversions are hard on families. It was like pulling my family through a fire hose. 
I mean, my wife felt betrayed. She felt angry. She couldn't believe what had happened to me. Our marriage hung on by the thinnest of threads for about two years. Our kids couldn't understand what was going on at home because mom was constantly yelling at dad very angrily and she didn't understand what was ha they didn't understand what was happening. Uh, I remember one encounter that I'll share with you moms and dads out there and you who are going to be moms and dads. But you know, I was kind of in the worst of the trough where things were really, really bad at home about two years of this after I'd come to Christ. And I remember pulling into our little garage in Elba Park and I remember just praying, closing the door, shutting off the car, and praying so earnestly, God, I need to feel your presence. And, and he said something that just rocked me to the core. He said to me, Dan, the mess your family is right now is a product of your sin. You did not raise them to know and love me. And I just started to cry. I just started to cry uncontrollably. I cried for the better part of two days. I remember I had to go down to uh, Open Sesame on McLeod to have lunch with Pastor Ray Matheson, who was kind of trying to shepherd me through all this. And I remember pulling into the lot and saying to Ray, I told him what had happened, and I was crying uncontrollably with Ray in the car. And I said to him, Ray, it's, it's the most incredible thing, because I feel as though God has given me a glimpse of what sin looks like, as much as I could stand through his holy eyes. And in the same breath... I feel more loved than I've ever felt in my life. So I began to walk with God, and he began to teach me. And I thought maybe I would uh, share one of the lessons that he's been working on with me that seems to be a kind of a primary lesson with me. And, and it's that lesson that Paul wrote so poignantly about when he wrote, you know, that he has come to love his weakness because Christ's strength is perfected in our weakness. And one of the things that God has worked on with me over the years, and it seems to be a recurring theme he keeps fortifying, is that when I'm weak, I am strong. And for me to understand my dependence upon God. And he's come at it from three different sort of ways. Well, maybe four. I'm going to add a fourth one on here. But, but first of all, you know, he's come at it to me in many ways through business. When my business is slow, there have been times when it's been slow, and I've done everything I can do, all the business development I can think of. I can thrash and wail away trying to make something happen, and, and nothing happens despite my best efforts. And then he decides it's time to move again, blesses me, and all of a sudden the phone starts ringing, and I didn't, do anything, I didn't have anything to do with it. So he's come at it through business. He came at it through health. I remember being at a workshop up in Edmonton where I was working with a construction firm up there, doing a half-day workshop, and I began to get this pain in my lower abdomen. And I thought, I can push through this, because I'm a push-through it kind of guy. And I got, I got through it, and then I got in the car, and I thought, I can make it home. I'll just make it to the other end of the road. And I started to drive, and by the time I got to Edmonton, I was shaking, I was sweating, I was overcome with pain, and it became very clear to me that I was not getting home on that day. So I pulled off into the Red Deer Hospital, was admitted, was diagnosed uh, that um, I was having, um, oh, what's the, oh, I can't remember the name, but I was having a, a bowel attack, essentially. So um, I remember the doctor said, you know, you're septic. Like, you're being poisoned from the inside right now. That's what's happening. My temperature spiked. He said, we're going to have to do an emergency operation, uh, cut out the section that's bad, and you're going to have to leave, you know, with the bag and the whole deal. And I looked at him and I said, you're not doing anything till I pray. <laughs> I'm praying first. So I ended up spending four days in the hospital. He said, I'll give you two days. And if your white blood cell comes down, your temperature comes down, you'll be okay. If not, we're going to go in and do this. And I prayed. Long story short, God healed me, healed me completely. Four days later, I left the hospital. That was totally beyond my control. I had reached the limits of what I could do. The third area, the third area where God came at this was a little bit more recent. And that's when someone so very dear to me very, very dear to me, had an accident, a physical accident, and ended up spending four days in the Foothills Trauma Ward. When she left the Foothills Trauma Ward, she had a lot of spinal pain. And so they prescribed, prescribed opiate-based medication, pain medication for her. Um, one thing led to another, and you know where the story's going. She began to crush the medication and inject it. And then she fell into heroin addiction. 
And you know what I'm saying when I say that. So we tried everything, Sarah and I, everything we could do to, to save this person we love so very much. We enrolled her in the very best programs in the entire country, spent a fortune with this out on Vancouver Island. Nothing was working. And one day I, I remember coming into church, and Sarah couldn't even make it into the, into the building. And I walked in, and I was crying almost uncontrollably, but i got to get to church, right? And I'm sitting in church, and I'm praying. And God, God said to me so clearly, he said, give her to me. You know, what you guys are doing is actually getting in the way. You've got to give her to me. And all of a sudden, my tears dried up, and I got this incredible sense of peace. And then the peace moved into a sense of confidence. And I went home to Sarah, and I said, she's going to be okay, but we've got to give her to God. And from that point on, God began to orchestrate a remarkable plan. You know, it started with her being thrown out of this treatment facility. And, you know, I remember saying to my wife, God doesn't want her there. She hasn't been thrown out. He doesn't want her there. She, they described her as untreatable. He doesn't, he doesn't want her there. So they, they threw her out. She came home. She began to form a couple of key relationships that were just so critic, so obviously God's hand in bringing these people into her life. We ended up confronting demonic oppression in this and overcoming it and freeing this person of that. And all of these things came together, and long story short, today she is three years clean, totally free, totally released. She doesn't feel triggered anymore. She is set free in the power of Christ. We couldn't do that for her. I was at the end of my rope. God was not at the end of his rope. So, you know, I have come to believe that God doesn't just want me to accept my dependence upon him. God wants me to rejoice in my dependence upon him. And I think, hopefully that's something in the important work that you guys do, that maybe resonates a little bit. I also think that sometimes we limit God a little bit. I know he can't really be limited, but what I mean is we sometimes like to think that, you know, does God really do the stuff he used to do back then in, in the biblical era? And I'm, I'm going to tell you that he does. He does. So, you know, I've seen this person I love so dearly delivered from demonic oppression, and I've come to believe that's a bigger part of addiction than we like to think it is oftentimes. But I want to tell you about one other story quickly. I think I have a bit of time for this. And I just want to tell you about um, a healing I was involved with. Because I've seen lots of miracles. But one that was a physical miracle. So our elder daughter, Paige, that we're talking about earlier, Marissa's friend, she uh, used to be a counselor at Camp Chief Hector. On one occasion, she was out there, and she had a friend out there, same name, Paige, a woman from Australia who'd come over. And uh, she was working at Camp Chief Hector when she ended up with a collapsed lung. And uh, they moved her, first of all, to one hospital, tried to reinflate the lung, didn't work. I'm trying to abbreviate this story quickly. Her folks are in Australia, so we're trying to love her and minister. We're visit her, visiting her daily in the hospital. So then they decide, this isn't working. We're going to have to operate. So they moved her over to Foothills, and they took off the bottom third of her lung and stitched it up and all that good stuff. So we're visiting her daily, and on one occasion, uh, I'm there with our younger daughter, Haley, and the two of us are there together, and, I, and she is, this page, is writhing in pain. Writhing. You know, she's got the morphine pump that you can hit every five minutes, and she's hitting it every three, hoping for something. And she's screaming. And I hear the Holy Spirit say to me, put your hands on her and pray for her. And I'm thinking, God, you can't really mean that. Like That's high-stakes stuff, really? Put your hands on her and pray for her. I said to her, Paige, do you mind if we pray for you? She said, no, that's okay. I said, can I put my hands on you? She said, that's okay. So I said to our younger daughter, I said, honey, we're going to put our hands on Paige and we're going to pray for her. I put my hands on. Our younger daughter put, my hand, put her hands on. I said, Heavenly Father, you are, you know, limitless in what you can do. You are Almighty God. And so in Jesus' name, I am asking you to come between this girl and her pain. I said that word in Jesus' name. She sat up, pulled up right in the bed, sat right up, 
She said, it's gone. It's completely gone. We sat and talked with her for 90 minutes. She did not touch that pump once. She chatted like a giddy schoolgirl for 90 minutes. Before that pray, pay, prayer, she was writhing. So I want you to know, don't you ever believe God doesn't do that anymore. And don't you ever believe that in the power of Christ's name, he will not do great things through you. You, be access, you make access to that. He does it today. He releases people. He heals. He does it all today, just as he did it in the biblical era. So it's been 14 years now since I've been doing this walk, and I find myself back at that same place of dependence again. I had the most discouraging conversation the other night with our elder daughter, Paige. This is Marissa's friend. Paige would call herself an atheist. And I can't even talk to her about God. Every time I do, she just gets angry. She doesn't want to have the conversation. She's just sure there isn't a God. And you know, um, I've tried everything I can try. So here I am again, back in that place. It's become pretty familiar asking God to do for what my daughter what I can't do and what she doesn't seem to be able to do for herself. You know, I, I prayed to God in that garage that he would help me make right that which I had messed up with my family. And about three years after I came to Christ, my wife Sarah came to Christ. Amen. Shortly after that, Haley came to Christ, our younger daughter. We're three down, one to go. <laughs> I believe in his time, he'll do that. So I just want to leave you, because you're doing such important work here. I just want to leave you with the encouragement that God is a limitless God. And when scripture tells us all things are possible with God, it means all things. So, you know, let's go forward in strength and confidence and in faith that through you and through this place, God has plans to set many, many more people free. So what I'd like to do is just close in prayer if I could for us, okay? Dearest Heavenly Father, you are such a good God. We love you so much, and we are so very thankful to you, Father God. We thank you, Father God, that when we are on our knees and we are rejoicing in our dependence upon you, that you are ready, willing, able, and even anxious to do great and wonderful things through your children. Father God, I lift everyone here everyone who is in remote locations, Edmonton, Foothills, I lift them all to you, Father God, and the important work that they are doing. Heavenly Father, I know you have great plans for this place, and so I pray that you bless them abundantly. I pray that you multiply the miracles here, and that you bring great glory to your name through what you will do here in this place and through these people. And I ask all of that, Father God, in the powerful and strong name of your Son, the one we call Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.